Well, thank you for the welcome and the introduction. Um, this multi-generational, multi-species house is myself and Dave and our adult children and our three grandchildren and two big dogs. We are watched over by both of them. Harley is enormous and a big black dog and he is the patron saint of naps. And um, Bonnie is known by her moniker, the Verminator. And she lives to kill whistle pigs. So her, that is her mission. It's what get her up, gets her out of bed every morning. And uh, so that's a little bit about us. So uh, anyway, one of the hats that I wear right now is as a member of the Vision Task Force here at Meridian Friends. And the invitation to uh, join that group was one that I gladly accepted because, as Pam mentioned, I do vision work. Um, and I love vision work because I find it inspirational and a lot of fun. So here we are. So our church is embarking on a vision journey. And in the weeks and months ahead, um, we're going to learn and talk a great deal about our church's vision. And then this is supposed to culminate in a day called Vision Day, which you saw on the screen this morning. And that is um, going to be May 30th. And that's a time when we're all going to get together and spend a, a day focusing on our church's vision and talking about it and coming to some kind of consensus over what that might be. Um, and in Sunday school, after this service, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about what to expect um, in the process going forward. So um, when, when Ken asked me to speak today, he suggested that I share a little bit with you about what I have learned about organizational vision um, and the visioning process, and then to talk about what we can ex anticipate um, going forward in the next several weeks and months. And um, I think it's important to, to clarify, although I do vision work with organizations, I am not here to give you five easy steps to your church's vision or anything like that. I would never presume to do that. I have questions just like many of you do. And um, the church vision process is a dynamic, kind of unfolding, organic kind of a thing, um, and it involves all of us. So the answer to where God is leading Meridian Friends Church is one that we are all going to discern together. Um, and uh, what I do have, though, are my observations uh, that I have made as I have walked alongside other churches and other Christian organizations. And so to the extent that those are helpful, I'm going to share those today. Um, and I want to give credit also to Andy Stanley for some of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's contained in his book, Visioneering. And you saw a slide about that also at the beginning. And if you're interested in exploring this topic more fully, um, then you can um, get a hold of one of those copies and, and read along with us. So last week, Ken said that we need to, to be able to put words to our church's vision. And this is really important. We need to spend time talking about it and praying about it and um, getting to the point where we can articulate it with clarity. Clarity is what is going to enable us to see the vision, and then it can be shared, and then it can be a unifying force for the church, and it can pull us forward into the future together. Um, it explains the why of what we do. So why are we spending our resources and our time and so on the way we are? That, that can be answered by a clear vision. And part of the importance of um, doing vision work is that once we've taken the time to get clarity, then we can be much more attuned to things around us um, that are related to that vision. And we might notice some things that we otherwise would not notice, um, including things, frankly, that are hidden right in plain sight, right under our noses. So over these next few months, we're going on this journey together. And we are setting out on this journey to discern what vision we ha God has for, for uh, Meridian Friends' future. And we have chosen this journey because we're, as a church, we are at a crossroads. And we have met a big goal, which is that we paid off a big mortgage. So, yay, right? Yay. Um, that frees us up to be responsive to God's leading in perhaps new and different ways. And so this is the crossroads where we have found ourselves, and we have chosen to do this visioning journey together um, because we, we want to include everyone in the discernment process. And most importantly, if we really believe as friends that 
God can and does speak to any one of us and through any one of us, if we believe that, then each one of us potentially has something very significant to contribute to this process. Right? So, so here we are. So now I have to tell you a, a little disclaimer about this journey ahead. It might seem a little bit like a wild goose chase. Okay? Now, how many of you have ever tried to catch a wild goose? Good luck, right? It's not easy. Um, they are um, unpredictable and strong-willed, but the Celtic Christians refer to the Holy Spirit as the wild goose. Did you know that? That's the metaphor that they use. And uh, it's apt, don't you think? Um, a wild goose, its methods don't make sense to us, right? Not necessarily. Um, Jesus said it this way. He said, the wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. That's John 3, 8. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. Right? The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He said, now we see but a, but a poor reflection. Um, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now, this side of heaven, I know in part. But then, in heaven, I will know fully, even as I am fully known. Another translation that you might be familiar with says, now we see through a glass darkly. But I recently discovered another possible translation, <clears throat> and it says that the word enigmata, which translators render darkly, that's the word that they translate darkly, um, that can also mean stories. And um, in this translation, it could read like this. <clears throat> now we see the world and the human condition in metaphors in stories. Now, I think stories are a really helpful way to understand spiritual things. And Jesus told a lot of them. Jesus, vision really is a spiritual thing at its root. It really is. And I have a friend um, who you will meet later in this vision, visioning process, one of my colleagues. And he says it this way, vision is a spiritual bind. So you'll hear him say that. Vision is a spiritual bind. Okay. So as we get ready for this journey, I'm going to share a few stories with you that might help us conceptualize exactly what a vision is. Um, so what is it, and how will we know it? What is its power? It can all seem kind of fuzzy, can't it? And yet, fuzzy things are real. Scripture is full of examples. But how will we know whether we are discerning correctly what God has for Meridian friends? These are all really good questions. Now, when we go on any journey, we typically um, do, do a few things. We talk about where we're going to go, and um, we talk about where we're going to stay, how we're going to get there, um, and then we we talk about maybe some hazards along the way, and like any journey, this journey can have some hazards along the way, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what those could be, and then how to handle them, and then finally at the end of our time today, I'm going to give us a few things that we each want to be doing to prepare for this um, journey going forward. So are you ready to go? Okay. So here's a thought about journeys. A friend of mine, um, who is a pastor in Canada, he encouraged me to never go on vacation again. He said, never go on a vacation again. He said, instead, we should have the mindset of going on a pilgrimage. And by this he meant, don't just go to get away from it all or to have fun or to see new places, although trips are great and all those things, right? Um, but what he meant is um, this. There's a dictionary definition of a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage, and it's this, to take a journey to a sacred place. So he meant that instead of going with a vacation mindset, we should go instead on an intentional journey to a sacred place, a place that is made sacred when you recognize that God is here and he's doing something in this place and he's doing it right now. And my friend suggested that if we simply ask God 
what he is up to. Um, you say, God, what are you up to here? Now, here. If we ask him that, he will be delighted. He can tell us. Now, it wasn't long after my friends gave me this bit of advice that Dave and I and my sister and brother-in-law um, took a trip to Scotland. And I was very excited about this week, this trip, okay? Because a good chunk of my family is from Scotland, and this trip had been on my bucket list for years. Um, and I have to confess here, through confessions, I have a serious genealogy habit. Um, and so I did all kinds of research before the trip, okay? I researched any place that could possibly have historical significance for some part of our family, and so we, we drafted our itinerary around visiting these places. And we saw so many castles and so many little towns out of the way. And we saw um, a big, fantastic trip we took through the Highlands, and they're gorgeous. Um, so we saw all kinds of things. I think about the only thing we didn't see was Nessie. Okay, <laughs> the infamous Loch Ness monster. She was very uncooperative. She did not show up for us. Um, but what we did see on the shores of Loch Ness was a scientist who has lived in a trailer on the beach at Loch Ness, which, by the way, is very chilly. Um, he has lived there for 30 years, sitting on the, side, on the shore of Loch Ness, waiting for Nessie to make her appearance. I think he has a vision, but I'm just not sure that it's going to be entirely fruitful for him. Now, many people will tell you that Scotland and the UK and Western Europe is post-Christian. Um, and um, I think that that is, that is largely true. Um, and um, I saw that as we, as we traveled through Scotland. Um, and we started our, so here we were, we were on a pilgrimage, right? Because I was determined to go with, um, with a pilgrimage mindset. So here I am on a pilgrimage in a post-Christian nation. Um, and I asked God, you know, what are you doing here um, right now? And one of the first things that we saw, we started our journey in Glasgow. And one of the first things that I saw was this statue. Right smack in the middle of the city. So what do you see? A homeless man, right? Right? Right there, right in the middle of the city. Okay, now I'm going to zoom in. Now what do you see? Who's the homeless man? Right? Is your vision expanded? Have, we've now noticed something. We've had a God sighting here, right? Um, and it was hidden right in plain sight. And a lot of these, this was right at the, at the center of the city and next to the train station. So anybody in Glasgow who's taking the, I mean, it's a beehive of activity. There's people going every which way. And I was fascinated by a couple of things. Um, first of all, it turned out to be on the front door of a very innovative church plant there in the heart of Glasgow, that when you climb the steps into the church, um, you look into, and there's a church, but as you look through the doors on the other side, there's a rest, it opens to a restaurant, okay? And so people are drawn to the restaurant who might never, ever otherwise darken the doorway of the church in a post-Christian place. Um, the other thing I was fascinated by was, was the fact that all these people walking by the statue, nobody took a look at it. They just kind of kept on going. Um, God, are you up to something yet? I think you are, right? It was clear to me that some people in Glasgow had a vision from God to plant a church right there, and that was how God's vision was being carried out in that particular place. Vision moves people. It moves people to action. And a God-given vision starts with concern, or you might, we might call it a burden, right? No doubt, some people in Glasgow had a vision um, or a burden to plant this church. Vision is also what moves people from one place to another. Um, in my genealogy habit research, um, I researched um, the branches of our family tree, and I noticed a, a consistent theme, and that, that, that was this, that there, is a, there was typically a gap, a really uncomfortable gap, 
between their reality and what they knew could be. And that gap that hurt a little bit, that gap was the seed of a vision. And that is what moved them. For example, one branch of my family was Welsh. My seven times great grandfather was a man named Thomas. Thomas lived in Montgomeryshire, Wales in the 1600s. And he happened to be a high ranking clergyman in the Church of England. And um, the wild goose interrupted his life in a most unexpected way. He met a man named George Fox. And most of you probably know who he is. He was the founder of the Society of Friends. And apparently these two had more than a casual acquaintance because um, in time, Thomas became convinced that this direct encounter with Christ that George Fox was talking about was actually real. And he spoke to his superiors at the Church of England about this. And I like to imagine him saying, you know this George guy? He's right. Like, there is but one who can speak to my condition, right? Um, but his superiors were not impressed. And in fact, they were so not impressed that they excommunicated him immediately. And I, he was probably lucky to get off that easy. But he couldn't shake his newfound convictions. And so he built a Quaker meeting house on his own property. And that meeting house grew very, very rapidly um, as the Friends movement in that part of the world just took off. Um, but soon persecution came along and set in, and um, some of the members of the meeting house were jailed, some were tortured, um, many died in the horrific unsanitary conditions in the jails, and I will spell you, spare you the details about that. But after years of watching his fellow friends go through this, the family had had enough, and they started hearing about this experiment in the new world called Philadelphia. And um, what happened was they went to George, he went to George, and he said, George, I think it's maybe time, maybe God is calling my family to Philadelphia. And George listened, and George concurred with him, and then said, but I have one request to make. That is that you would leave your oldest son behind to watch over the friend's meeting house in this place. Now, he had seven children. So that was agreed upon, and the family um, set sail for Philadelphia, um, saying goodbye to their oldest son. But the wild goose was with them. Um, they arrived in Philadelphia, where they joined the friend's church in Philadelphia, and they apparently began to thrive in America. Now, what happened to the oldest son? Well, he stayed to watch over that friend's church in Wales. And he lived to watch the friend's movement in that part of the world die. And the meeting house became empty and ruined. What? Like, is that the way the story's supposed to end? <laughs> but yet the wild goose was with him too. Amen? Amen. So here's the truth. Sometimes the vision is born out of pain. And sometimes it can have a very high cost. Another branch of my family was French. They were Huguenots, which is to say that they were French Calvinist Protestants at a time when France was almost entirely Catholic. And this was not pretty. There was terrible persecution. Finally, in 1598, um, King Henry IV signed the Edict Nantes, and in that edict, it said, stop persecuting the Huguenots, and it gave them some space for a while. But then in 1685, that's 80 years later, um, King Louis XIV comes along, and he revoked that edict with another edict of his own. And when this happened, things got really, really bad, really, really fast. Um, and so Huguenot members of the clergy, it's hard to believe this is true history, but it is. Um, Huguenot members of the clergy were given two weeks to get out of the country or be executed. But the rest of them were forbidden to leave the country. So uh, the clergy were forced out, the rest were told they couldn't leave. Um, but in staying, they had to convert to Catholicism or the men would go to prison, the women would go to convents, and the children would be taken from their families and raised in Catholic orphanages. Huguenot churches would be closed and reopened as Catholic churches. 
Now, when you think about it, what really happened here was a clash of visions of really seismic proportions. Um, both sides evidently believing that God was on their side. There's a lot to unpack here, and we can't get into it today, but suffice it to say this, it is possible to be very, very, very wrong about whether a vision is from God. And I happen to think one of the superpowers of the Friends Church is that we rely on group discernment um, to test a vision. So visions can and should be tested. Now apparently, this Huguenot family, we had at least one member of the family who was a pastor. And so he's got two weeks to get out or be executed. And um, so here's what happened. Um, the congregation got together and they decided something that might sound crazy to us in our time, but it made sense in theirs. They decided to burn their own church to the ground rather than let it reopen as a Catholic church. So that's what they did. And then, my family was vintners, by the way, grape growers, winemakers. So here's how they escaped France. They got a bunch of wine barrels, and they put each member of the family in a wine barrel. They put those wine barrels on the back of a horse-drawn cart, and somebody, and I'd like to meet this person someday in heaven and ask a few questions, somebody drove that horse-drawn cart out of France. Yeah. And um, so they made it. Three generations made it out. The grandparents, the parents, and the, and the grandchildren. And they were part of a vast, illegal migration, because they were forbidden to leave, but they were part of a large migration. There were 400,000 people, historians estimate, who got out. I don't know how many in wine barrels. They must have thought there was a lot of wine being exported at that time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway, they, they were forced to escape, and they chose to escape because their vision did not include forced conversion, death, imprisonment, family separation, and so on. So my family crossed the English Channel. Um, that horse-drawn carriage made it to the coast, and they, they uh, crossed the English Channel, and they ended up at the Huguenot Church of Threadneedle Street in the Garment District of London. And so this family of vintners had to become tailors, and that's what they did. But life for immigrants was not good in England at that time. This was a French ghetto, basically, inside of London, and the conditions were very, very poor. And um, so, so the grandson, was a little boy sealed in a wine barrel. By the time that grandson was a grandfather himself, he said, family, we're not home yet. It's time to go. And they decided to come to America. And they headed for Philadelphia, and guess where they ended up? The Friends Church, right, in Philadelphia. And um, by the way, the name of the ship that took them from the literal ashes of their former life to their new vision, the name of that ship was the Phoenix. I found their names on the ship's roster. Now the story doesn't end there, it goes on, okay? So the grandson, the one who was a little boy on the second grandson, so this is now we're down the generation, so the one who was a little boy on the Phoenix now, um, he went on to grow up. Um, he became a rancher and a landowner himself here in America, and one day, when he was all grown up, he bought a large piece of property, the purchase of which included 17 slaves. I found the deed of purchase, and it actually itemizes the human beings on the deed, um, along with the acreage. But the very next day after that deed recorded, he filed another document in the courts, and I found that document also. In that document, he freed all 17 slaves. Now, I'm speculating here, but I wonder what stories he heard as a child um, from his grandfather about his escape being sealed in a wine barrel. I wonder what he heard in the Friends Church about slavery. I wonder if that Friends Church is where he caught his vision for God's justice. And I wonder what his own memories were of being treated very badly in a land that was not their own. I think that those stories and memories probably changed him, and they molded his character, and they shaped his view of the world. 
think he knew the wild goose. So yes, sometimes a vision is born out of pain, and it can have a great cost. But a God-given vision can also be handed down from generation to generation. So now I'm going to speak to those of you among us um, <clears throat> who might be seasoned saints among us. Perhaps you're in your 80s or 90s. Those of you who are, who are in your 80s or 90s, did you know that a vision that God has given you can outlive you? It can. And did you know that you can pass it on down to future generations? And did you know that we need you to do this for us? We do. So don't ever, ever think that because a vision is in the future that you're done. You're not. Now think about your own families and their experiences um, and your own experiences and how that might have shaped the way that you see the brokenness in God's world. Right? We've all traveled a unique path. Um, maybe you know some of the visions that your grandparents and your great-grandparents had um, that led to you today. Um, because of your individual life journey, what do you see that perhaps other people don't see? You might just notice things differently. And we've talked about the book Visioneering. And um, in it, um, Andy Stanley examines the biblical story of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, you may know, was a man who lived in the 6th century B.C. I'm sorry, my paper just keeps sliding off of here. Um, in the 6th century B.C. And um, he, along with the Jews from Jerusalem, had been carried off into exile in Persia by this Babylonian invasion that had sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the city walls, and destroyed the temple. Now, for the Jews, it was hard to imagine a greater desolation than having Jerusalem destroyed. Um, Jerusalem was God's city, after all, right? It was really hard for them to, to deal with this. And although later King Cyrus allowed Jews to go back and rebuild, um, even after that happened, news reached Nehemiah that the city wall was still broken down and the temple was being ignored and in some cases even filled with pagan worship. And he felt that gap, that great disconnect between what was and what could be and what should be. And he was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, and he, um, he, had, to, he had to wrestle with this God-given vision to restore the walls, to restore the city of Jerusalem. And he was compelled because his heart was broken by this vision that God had given him. Now, carrying out this vision wasn't easy. First of all, he's the cupbearer to the king, so he's got to ask permission from the king. And the cupbearer, as you know, is the guy who samples the drink, to, and when the cupbearer doesn't keel over dead, then the king would know that it would be okay to drink it. So he's kind of an integral part of the staff, right? So um, what are the odds of the king approving him going? Um, but God was with him, and um, so he gets permission to go, but when he got there, he had to deal with all kinds of things. He had to deal with people who say, um, it can never be done. That'll never happen. It'll never be done. And then they made fun of him, and people spread rumors about him. And at one point, when you read the biblical account, he actually has his builders building. So they're building the wall with one hand, and they're holding swords in the other hand to fend off the attackers while they're rebuilding the wall. So not exactly ideal conditions to carry out a vision. So here's the thing. Reaching a God-given vision, it requires prayer. Um, and lots of prayer and even more prayer. And here's one of the tricky things about a vision. By definition, it's something that you haven't seen yet and you haven't done it yet. So it's never been done, right? That's the nature of a vision. And so that means that history would appear to be on the side of those who would say, it'll never happen. So at this stage, a God-given vision is very, very fragile. And Andy Stanley's book talks about this. How do we steward a vision? How do we take care of it um, to make sure that it comes to fruition? 
It's almost um, delicate like an embryo. It's delicate. So Nehemiah had his road hazards on his journey on, to carry out his vision. He had some road hazards. And what might we at Meridian Friends find to be the hazards that could be awaiting us? What kind of trolls are going to be peeking out from under the bridges at us as we go on this journey? So I'm just sharing my observations here um, based on what I've seen in some other churches and organizations that I have worked with. And these may or may not be dangers for some or all of us. Um, and they are five fears, is what I've called them. And fears can be formidable, and they can stop us in our tracks. So here's fear number one. And I'm calling this one fear of the fuzzy. OK? And here's what I mean by that. Visioning is a process that engages our God-given imaginations. Now, for some of us, especially those of us who have become adults somewhere along the road, um, using our imaginations is something that we've probably become a little rusty at, right? I watch my grandkids, and they've got the airplanes going and all kinds of crazy things they're imagining, um, and we've, we've kind of gotten rusty at that kind of work. Um, we are, however, really good at a negative form of visioning. We call it worry, right? We can imagine all sorts of horrible scenarios in great excruciating detail. Um, so we do know how to do it, we just need to invert it, okay? Um, we're used to focusing on reality, which is the bills to pay, the car to fix, the kids to raise, and, you know, and so on. Um, so using our imagination to envision a future can feel a little unfamiliar, and unfamiliar can feel a little uncomfortable. Um, kind of like doing that first workout in January. After you make your New Year's resolutions, it can leave you a little stretched, a little uncomfortable. It can feel fuzzy. It can feel even a little bit touchy-feely for some of us. Um, but just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't real. Because air, you can't see air, but air is real, right? Um, so fuzzy things are real. Okay, here's fear number two. The fear of presumption. <laughs> and this is when we we're afraid to presume to assert our own wishes over God's will, right? Now, as Christians, we know that we are quite, we quite literally belong to Christ. We are not our own. Um, we have been bought at a price. That's 1 Corinthians 6.20. Everything we own, own, um, belongs to Jesus, including our most cherished agendas and our dreams and our plans. He will, if we allow him, give us higher aspirations than we ever could have imagined on our own. And in fact, he has the right to do that. And the wild goose has a history of interrupting us with those sorts of things. So he, we, know, we know that we belong to Christ. So we approach this visioning process, and really all things, we approach it in the right spirit when we kind of hold out our hands loosely, right? Um, we hold everything loosely in our hands out of reverence for Christ. James says, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. You ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. And if we're sincere about wanting to follow Christ, we don't want to presume to exert our will when we should be yielded to his will instead. We know this. We must leave room for him to interrupt us. We know we are slaves for Christ. So um, the danger, it's a balance, right? And so we know, we know this. We know he has the right. Um, so sometimes we err in the other direction, which is that we just sit still because we're not sure, right? But following implies that we have to be moving, right? It implies initiative and movement on our part. Um, and, and a belief that he is certainly capable of sharing a vision um, for our future. So here's fear number three. Fear of making an idol out of our plans. Jesus said we're a slave to whatever masters us. And the tricky thing about idols is they lie. 
you know, they don't just introduce themselves and say, hello, I'm your idol, nice to meet you, right? They don't identify themselves. Instead, they sneak around and they masquerade as something else. So as Christians, we're very, very wise if we seek to avoid this danger at all costs. We have to humbly depend upon Christ to guide us, and he is faithful to do that. One question we can ask to guard against this is to ask whether we have come to a place where the vision or the plan drives us rather than serves the purpose. Okay? If it's driving us and it's an impediment to serving and following Christ, pretty good sign we might have mistaken it um, and gotten things wrong. The moment we get a whiff of being driven um, rather than the vision serving us as a means of following Christ is the moment we say, okay, time out, we need to take a look at this. Now here's, here's fear number four. This one is really, really scary. It's the fear of abandonment and exposure. And this one sneaks up on us when we consider communicating with God. We find ourselves either fearing that he won't speak, or he might be speaking, but I can't hear him, or we can't hear him. And it's hard to say which is worse. At the root of this, sometimes, are what I call the twin terrors of um, abandonment and exposure. So abandonment is that he's not speaking to me, or exposure, ooh, I'm supposed to be a Christian. I must be a fake. So depending on our role in the Christian community, sometimes those are really difficult things to, to wrestle with. But we have to focus on the character of our master. He says, never will I leave you or forsake you. He says we are his children, and he will not abandon us or leave us as orphans. He is not hard of hearing. He always hears when his children call on his name. And he certainly hears when one who is not yet a child of his calls upon him. He is El Roy, the God who sees me. He does hear us. He does see us. But the expectation that mature Christians will always, consistently, clearly, and effortlessly hear him precisely, that expectation is not borne out in Scripture. It's just not. Um, that's why Paul said we don't see clearly now. Discernment is both a spiritual gift and a spiritual practice. Um, and when we approach... Um, Discernment in a spirit of humble dependence, that's when we are actively engaged with communicating with God. Last one. Are you terrified yet? Okay. The last one is the fear of accountability. Sometimes it's this one that gets us. And it's almost the opposite of fear number four. So this one is the fear that God will speak directly and clearly, and I will hear him, and he might show me something that I don't want. When this happens, we no longer have that out of saying we don't hear him. And of course, the supreme irony here is that we never really had that out to begin with because he's known our hearts all along, right? Um, sometimes we're paralyzed by our own inadequacies or our circumstances and we're kind of stuck and we need a really direct um, communication from God. Um, but we can no longer claim that we don't know what he is calling us to do or to be in the world when you know you're responsible. And so you have to lay down your own aspirations, or lack thereof, and pick up the ones that he has chosen for us. So here's the truth that we know about fear. Fear not. Fear of any of this stuff is not sent from God. We have ultimate security as his children. And if we are going to embrace the gift of our futures as gracious gifts from a loving father, we are sooner or later going to have to face the fact that faith in Christ is antithetical to fear. Fear is based always on the lie 
that Jesus cannot or will not choose to care for us. Clearly, this lie is ridiculous once you drag it out from under its rock into the light of day. We have zero to fear. Perfect love drives out fear. And the wild goose is with us. So let's look at some final preparations as we journey together. So here are some tasks to help prepare you for the weeks and months ahead. First, pray and pray and pray some more. Ask God to show us his desired future for us. Ask him to speak to us in ways that we can hear him. Ask him for his wisdom for all of us. He freely gives. Ask him to help us obey. Ask him to help us see our community here at Meridian through his eyes. And ask him for an overflowing measure of grace for one another as we travel this road together. We're going to need it. Then, after you've done all those things, pray some more. Think about your own life's journey. What aspects of your life have contributed to how you see the brokenness of creation? What do you see that someone else might not see? Are any of these things that you see a potential focus of ministry for this church going forward? They might be. Then you're going to pray even more. Ask God what part you will play in moving our church forward. Then notice your reactions to what he shows you. Ask him what you need to learn. Ask him what we all need to learn. Ask him whether we need to lay anything down in order to be able to pick up a new thing. Then pray even more. Go as a pilgrim. Remember that pilgrim mindset? We're going to go as a pilgrim to a sacred place. Ask him where he's working here, and then go. I think you're getting the idea here. Do not underestimate the power of prayerful preparation for this journey. Visions can be born of pain. They can come at a high cost. And navigating these realities can be hard. All of this is true. But visions can move people. They can move us, they can bring us together, and they can pull us into God's desired future. I'm going to leave you with one more image from our trip to Scotland. We were traveling down the west coast of Scotland, and we were learning about a period of time called the Highland Clearances. And the clearances, as they're called, is a period of time when many people in the Highlands were forced off of their land out of the Highlands. Um, there were many reasons for this, um, mostly political exploitation, greed, you know, all the human stuff. Um, but many left the country because they had no alternative. And it was a time that resulted in trauma that really the Highlands have not recovered from to this day. When you travel the Highlands, I learned, you hear, you hear them talking about it like it was yesterday. And there's empty buildings everywhere, and the land is largely still uninhabited. Um, we stopped at a statue, and it's a monument to those who left, and it's called the Emigrants, and you can see it here. It's a statue of a Highland family who is having to leave, and I was just transfixed by this statue. Um, you can see that the father in the front is looking westward, 
toward the new world. The son is looking up at his father for reassurance. The mother is holding a baby, and she's going with them, but she's looking behind at everything they're leaving. So much left behind, but a vision for the future nonetheless. But as I stood there, I was most struck by the father's gaze. Can you see it? I see in his eyes a vision for something better. And I see in his eyes incredible strength and fortitude and determination and faith. May we follow after God in the same spirit. May we go pilgrimage with the wild goose to the sacred place where we recognize what God is doing here and now at Meridian Friends Church. And may we always, always remember that the end of every God-given vision is always God.